My name is Jake Scruggs, and I'm going to talk a little bit about hotspots with metric foo. So, without further ado, I should probably explain uh, what metric foo is. So, I don't know if you've used it or you haven't, but metric foo is a combination of a lot of metrics in one sort of gem. So you can do code metrics about the health of your code, whether you have a lot of complexity, whether you have code coverage, whether you have code smells, and there's a bunch of different gems that will do that for you. Um, and I kept having to rewrite a uh, rake task on every project I went to that would sort of collect all these metrics and put it into one nice report. And I thought, well, why not just turn that into a Rails plugin? And then later it became a Ruby gem. Uh, some people think uh, metric foo is only used on Rails projects. It actually can be used on Ruby projects too. Um, and it gets you a lot of stuff. So I'm gonna go pretty fast over the stuff it gets you and then more in depth later. So if you feel like you're falling behind, there will be explanations. So you can get things like flog results. So flog is uh, code complexity analysis and basically it tells you where you have high complexity. And we graph these things over time so you can see, hey, like my average complexity is going up, but we also graph like the top 5% of your most complex methods over time which to me is much more indicative of how your project's doing because average complexity is not gonna change much day to day, but your worst methods, they tend to get a lot worse pretty quick if you don't keep an eye on them. Um, you can do RCOV. Uh, this is probably the most well-known metric um, and one of the hardest to get running, but more on that later. Uh, RCOV is code coverage. Uh, this <laughs> yeah, more on this graph uh, later, but... Um, <laughs> Shut up. Um, <laughs> Arcov is, uh, if you run your tests, what lines in your code have been executed, and so now you can get a percentage of how much, uh, you know, your, how much code your tests cover. Uh, Reek is one of many uh, code smell detectors, and it discovers things like, hey, you have an uncommunicative name, or you have a long method, or you have some sort of other problem which tends to lead to badness, um, and we track those. Uh, Rails Back Practices is a code smell detector specifically focused on Rails. We don't run that if we're not in a Rails project, but if you are, we run this. And it'll tell you certain things about your Rails project that you probably shouldn't be doing. Flay is uh, structural duplication, so at its simplest, it's copy-paste detection, but it's so much more than that, because what you can do is find out if the code is very similar, but written in a different way. So it sees through things like define method or def right, or curly braces versus do end, or even if you have a big chunk of code that's doing all the same things, but the names are all different, it will detect that as similar code. So it's a very cool and sophisticated tool. Um, psychro is psychromatic complexity. Not pronounced, pronounced psychuru, it's pronounced psychro. Uh, it's a joke, like psychromatic complexity, get it? Um, and that is the number of paths through a given method, right? So if you have a cyclomatic complexity of 10, there's 10 different ways to get through that method with all the ifs and the elses and the unless uh, things that uh, determine all your branching. We also do source control churn. So things that change a lot can indicate a problem. They can also uh, not matter at all, but it's a nice thing to know about. And Rudy is uh, yet one more code smell detector. Rudy's a little more uh, trying to be definitive. So Reek will present things that may be a problem. Rudy is trying to present only things that definitely are problems. So you won't see as many Rudy hits as you will see Reek hits. Um, and that's by design. The two people who wrote it are sort of coming from different points. Um, and so over the years, metric foo went from being like three reports, maybe four reports, to being like eight, nine, ten reports. Um, and that's a lot of data. And if you want to find bad places in your code, you have to kind of flip between all these reports and sort of go like, ooh, that one looked bad. Let's see how it scores on this other one. And that's just sort of terrible and hard to use. So from the beginning, what I thought would really be a cool thing in metric foo is if you can combine all of these reports into one report so it could tell you like, hey, this thing's bad for five different reasons. And then you could say, oh, wow, that's a really bad method. And then, oh, and it turns out it's totally uncovered by tests. Yeah, that's, that's one we should totally take a look at and uh, you know, destroy. Um, so, and our hotspots. Um, so now a little bit of a history lesson for you. Uh, a while back, the Dever guys uh, tried to, is anybody from Dever hanging out in the audience? Hey, is that Dan? Oh, hey, Dan. 
Um, the Denver guys uh, tried to commercialize Metric Foo and they created this product called Caliper, which lived in the cloud and you could point it at a GitHub repository and it would run a bunch of static analysis stuff on your uh, code base and it would tell you problems. And then they wrote this thing called Hotspots, which could bind all of the things into one report, which was really cool. So that was nice and I was totally jealous and Unfortunately for them, but luckily for Metric Foo, uh, Caliper didn't succeed, and uh, I convinced them to donate the code to the community. So thank you. Um, that was totally awesome. <laughs> so uh, we had to pull all this stuff in. Um, but this, I mean, it sounds trivial, right? But here's something that you don't really realize. Like, there's sort of like a lot of standards the, the great things about standards is there's so many to choose from, and you, this is one way you could represent any one of these methods. You could basically say bar baz or bar baz. Some, some metrics report this way if this is a class method, but some just report it always with a hash sign. Some metrics will keep a module that wraps around a class in the thing, but some metrics will not report the modules that wrap classes. So these could all be the same method. So what you have to do is find some way of sort of uh, extracting out all the differences. And the other problem you have is file paths, right? It's not a particularly terrible problem, but different metrics report file paths in different ways. So the solution is the location class. So the location class um, is not polite at all. I just got a bug report about an hour ago that said, hey, dummy, uh, I defined location in my project and you're overwriting that. So I should really probably, uh, you know, scope that to metric foo. So that's my, my fault, I'll fix that soon. Um, but <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, uh, there could be problems. Um, more on that later. So the location is basically taking in file pass class names and method names and sort of stripping out all the differences so that you can say, hey, given this thing, give me back something that is, and I can now tell if it's the same as everything else. So it's defined sort of an equal here. And now I can say, oh, here, I've got this class or method name. I'm going to give it to you, and you tell me if it's the same as something else. Um, which is pretty cool. And so we also define the spaceship operator, um, which is nice. And then we have some stuff in here to strip out some module names just so we can be consistent. Um, and so there's a fair amount of code now in metric foo that basically just uh, rips out stuff so that we can standardize file class and method names. Um, so that's great. That's awesome. Um, and it doesn't work at all for RCOV because RCOV has no concept of classes or methods. RCOV just says this line was covered or this line wasn't covered, which is, you know, actually all you really need most times when you're running RCOV, right? You just look through the report and you say, oh, these lines are covered and these <laughs> lines aren't covered. Um, but for my purposes, I really needed to get, I wanted like percent covered for a method. So I wanted to be able to say, hey, this method is 73% covered or this method is not covered at all. Um, which is kind of a tricky thing. And so I stood on this one for a really long time and it turns out it was just a, like I just shouldn't have, I should have just started writing some code. Um, I know we probably all have done this before, like it seemed like an insurmountable problem. Like, wow, like, you know, like I opened up Archive and looked inside it and was like, maybe there's something hidden in there where I can, no, there's nothing in there that I can use, hmm. And I don't want to parse Ruby files just to get their line numbers. I mean, that sounds like a lot of trouble, except that parse Ruby, oh wait, there's this thing called Ruby Parser, right? And Ruby Parser is actually like a really cool thing that you give it a bunch of Ruby and it can do some very cool stuff. It will do a whole bunch of stuff that I don't actually really need, but I'll tell you about it anyway. Um, it gives you the abstract syntax tree of some given Ruby as nested S expressions. Now, I don't know if you know my history, but I used to be a high school physics teacher and I don't have a computer science background. So this was all a little scary to me, like, whoa, S expressions, that sounds fancy. Um, so turns out not so bad, right? It's, you know, uh, when I first got into it, I went, oh, this is kind of like Lisp, which I don't know much about, but it was kind of interesting. And the cool thing is if you kind of dig around inside the guts of Ruby parser, um, it will tell you line numbers. Um, which is awesome. Um, now, before I move on, I should also point out that uh, Ruby Parser is behind the scenes of almost all, uh, or, or a good percentage of the uh, metrics provided by Metric Foo. Uh, metric Foo 
is uh, relies on things that like try to find uh, code complexity and code smells. And that's very hard to do if you have to parse a bunch of Ruby. But if you can use Ruby parser to look at the abstract syntax tree, it becomes much more easy. And so if you dig into the internals of a lot of those code smell detectors, you'll find Ruby parser in there. So behold, the line number class. It turns out this was like, you're going to laugh because why did I spend so much time fearing this when this, uh, this class is not very long? So literally all I do is I pass in the contents of a Ruby file. And uh, this is super simplistic and maybe totally wrong, but it does work. Um, so if it's a class, then I do one thing. If it's a module, I do something else. There's sometimes it's a block when you're defining a couple of things in a file. So you maybe you're defining two classes. Uh, Ruby parser will say, oh, well, I'll surround those two classes in what's called a block. And what we do, is uh, we process that stuff and we only expose two methods. One just says, hey, am I in a method for a given line number? So given line 23, is that in a method or is it outside a method? And then also, what is the method at that line number? And behind the scenes, what it's doing is it is building up a hash that has as its keys method names and as its values range objects. And it turns out it's just pretty simple. You, s you get the S expression that you want, and you say S dot line, and then if you say S dot last dot line, that's the last line number of the method, which is awesome. Uh, def n would be a instance method, and def s would be a class method. Um, now, sometimes you have to get a little tricky because what you have is you're inside a class self block, right? So it looks like a regular def, like a def n, but you're really inside a class self block, so that's a class method. Um, so you have to kind of like look for those things and search inside them. And then the problem I was having is that once I found them and then I went and looked for all the instance methods, I would find them again. So this is my super simple way to stop finding things. So what I do is after I've found something, I call hide methods from next round, trying to be as intentional as possible. And I just replace all of these guys that I've already found and sort of marked off as maybe a class method or inside a module or whatever. And I put in ignore me, which means nothing in terms of an abstract syntax tree. It's just a way for me to ignore them the next time I'm moving through uh, the abstract syntax tree. Um, there possibly is a very better way to do this, but that was the way I figured out. Um, so now we're in business, right? Because we've got all the things that we need. Archive stores uh, is, uh, has a way of outputting very detailed stuff, which we were already collecting in metric foo. So what we did is uh, we store all, uh, all the output of metric foo, in case you don't know, is serialized to YAML. So the cool thing about it is, if you wanted to use the output of metric foo, you can. Um, you can open up this object, load up the YAML, it's just a bunch of hashes and arrays inside it. This is uh, inside the uh, output of the archive. And you can just sort of literally read the class here, and then right next to it is a was run true, right? This is not the output of Arcub, but this is me taking the output of Arcub and turning it into uh, some YAML. And so I already had this data available. So now I can just loop over this thing, passing in this data uh, to the line number generator, and then start gathering information for what was covered and what isn't on the method level. So, all of a sudden, I can now pass this into the hotspot's magic rankifier. And the magic rankifier basically does something like this. It says, okay, I've got a maximum flog score across the whole app of 300, and I've got a minimum flog score of five. So we're just gonna say five is the lowest and 300 is the highest, and we're gonna define your rank based on where you are close to those two endpoints. And then it does that for Arkov, and it does that for Reek and Rudy, now, Reek and Rudy, since those things are kind of like code smells, we just do sort of a cheat and we just count the number. So we just say like, oh, you have seven Reek problems or you have eight Rudy problems. Um, and so now we can rank all these things and now based on where your percentiles are in all of these various things, we can say, oh, you're 90th percentile bad, you're 85th percentile bad and 100 percentile bad in these four, three, five, ten 10 metrics. And so now we can rank all these guys versus each other, which is pretty cool. So now it's time for the live coding demo. Dun, dun, dun. So we're gonna run metric foo on itself and see what happens. <laughs> 
So here I am inside metric foo. I'm going to run rake metrics all, which is exactly the same task you would run if you were inside whatever your Ruby project is and you wanted to get the metrics. You can configure it, um, but I'm using pretty standard configurations here. So waiting for things to load up. Spiking one of my cores. All right, so we're doing some parsing here. That is probably Psychro. And now we're running some tests, which are actually specs, uh, to get the Arcov output. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, generating some graphs. So I keep copies of all the previous runs for every day. So now that's how I graph that stuff over time. So I've serialized all the output and I save it in various files. So then I can go back and uh, mine all that stuff for things that you want. So here's the standard reports that you usually get with uh, metric foo and here's the brand new hotspots. So can you guys see this? looks pretty good. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so here is uh, three categories. We look at files, classes, and methods. Uh, the first thing I did wrong, uh, especially because the CSS sort of implies that, is I started reading left to right when I first looked at this. That is not the way to do this at all. Left to right has no meaning. It's up down. My visualization skills, uh, actually visualizations would be a really cool thing to do with all this data, and I just haven't done anything with that yet. So if you're interested, please submit. Um, so you have methods here, and these are ranked from top to bottom. So worst things at the top. So you can see this guy is pretty brutal, right? Like a flog score, 58.8, 58.4, not terrible, but getting close to terrible. Um, Psychro, 10, e, that's about five more than I usually like to have for a cyclomatic complexity in any method. Um, and uncovered code 97.4%, that basically means it's completely uncovered, right? Because Ruby always evaluates the first line, the def, <laughs> whatever, so you always get a little bit of coverage because it feels bad for you. Um, <laughs> so this guy is completely uncovered and seven code smells from Reek. Um, now, this is the delicious, delicious irony of metric foo at this point because the hotspots inside metric foo are the hotspots code which is pretty cool, or horrible, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but if you look through here, like metric analyzer, that's hotspots. Uh, let's see, metric analyzer, yep. Uh, location, oh yeah, I just showed you that guy. He's not really covered, he's got some problems. Uh, this is kind of weird, like what the hell does it mean to say you have 3.7 paths through something? Um, that's an average, right? So for a file, we're going to take whatever methods we have in there and do some averaging. So you can get some sort of nonsensical numbers sometimes. Um, so here's some more metric analyzer stuff. Um, awesome template apparently has some problems. Not so awesome. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's, let's take a little bit of a tour through the rest of this stuff. Uh, we got all these things that we can show. Um, churn uh, is pretty cool. You can see which things that change all the time. Um, that things don't change too, uh, when you're, what you're looking for in churn is you're looking for things that change way out of proportion to everything else. Um, so if you have one file that changes a hundred times over the last three months and every other file has only changed like ten times, that's a file that needs to change no matter what you do. And that is some sort of object that has its fingers in way too many things and you need to keep an eye on that object. Um, Flay structural duplication uh, has gone up lately. Youch. Um, Arkov, okay, so we're back to this graph, which I said I would discuss later, and now is the time. Um, so as an open source maintainer, you often have this dilemma where somebody will present you with a pile of code that does something really cool, and yet it's not covered at all. And no, normally, the right path is just to throw it back and say no, but uh, guess what? Sometimes it's so cool, you just take it in anyway. And that's, that's what I did uh, at least twice now in Metric Foo's history. Uh, the first time was when we serialized the YAML output. There was some wonderful work done, but it wasn't tested much at all. And so I brought it in, and then I sort of like slowly over the time sort of got it back up to like 91% coverage. And then I took in the hotspot stuff, and I feel like I'm bashing on the hotspots guys who, who gave me this wonderful gift, so don't read it that way. But um, I, you know, just have to go back now and sort of do some uh, testing of that stuff, uh, which is we which is fine. Test. Sorry, what? We had a test, but we didn't even test. You have tests? <laughs> what? Why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
well, that's awesome. All right, that, that's great. Okay, cool. Because I totally pulled that in going like, okay, I'm just committing to, I'll write some tests for that. It'll, it'll, it'll happen. Um, so cool. Uh, that, that's coming soon. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't plan that at all. Okay, so um, yeah. So Reek, uh, Reek and, uh, and Rudy and um, Rails best practices are all code smell things. I'm going to talk about that more in a little while. All right, so back to the presentation. Do, do, do. So let's make an important point here that a lot of times when you come to these conferences, people stand up here on stage and tell you how to do things, and you can get the impression that we're all sort of perfect, right? But I'm just some dude, right? Like I kind of write some code, and oftentimes I make a mess. And the important thing about making a mess is that you're probably going to do it no matter what you do. Uh, there will always be time constraints. There will always be new people on your team. There will always be consultants. There will always be things that you can blame for your mess, but it's probably your fault. Um, don't ignore them or hide them. Just clean them up. And that's sort of the big point of metric foo is everybody on every project always feels like, oh, man, the code's kind of a mess. And then when you ask everybody, like, what you should fix first, nobody agrees. And that was sort of the point of metric foo, was to help solve that problem. Like, what's the worst thing? Let's shoot the first charging buffalo first, right? <laughs> like, you know, like, we may get trampled, but we're going to take a few guys out, we're going to live a little longer, and it's going to be all right. Um, yeah, I don't know if that analogy works. Anyway, moving on. So problems with metric foo, other than the ones I just showed you. OK. so. Metric foo relies on, like it has eight, nine, ten reports, so it relies on a bunch of gems, which rely on a bunch of gems. So I did a fresh install of metric foo uh, using uh, that excellent RVM tool and uh, gem something. What are the thing? What? Gem sets. Oh, God, I love gem sets. So yeah, I just created a new gem set, did a fresh install of metric foo, and I got all these things. Uh, notice. Uh, we got we got a hole in here. Somebody doesn't understand development dependencies, um, but that's okay, because uh, I just learned about it recently too. So any change to any one of these gems, especially in how they output, can break metric foo because metric foo literally shells out to the command line and calls things like reek, right? Like we recently have tried to move away from that. Like uh, there was a big refactor, uh, so we don't call flog from the command line anymore, we call flog programmatically. And I'd like to do that more often in metric foo to kind of avoid these problems of, oh, they added an extra space to the output of flog and now everything's busted. Like, damn it. So yeah, there's a lot of regex parsing in metric foo, which I would like to go away sometime. Um, and then there's the classic things, right? There's different Rails versions, different Ruby versions. Um, but the biggest problem, and something if you're having problems with metric foo getting it running, like I suggest turning off rcov, because metric foo just shells out to the command line and runs rcov on all your tests or specs. And most people never run their tests that way, right? Like you probably have like some rake task that you call, and it may or may not set things up for your test suite. It may do certain various things. You may have some tricky things that happen in your test suite. Or you might have some order dependent problems that you don't know about in your test suite. So when the tests are run in a different order, they blow up. So a lot of problems of running metric foo can be traced back to Arcov because Arcov is the only real dynamic uh, processing we do in metric foo. Everything else is static analysis. In other words, meaning that we look at the code and just do some sort of static look at it, where Arcov actually tries to execute not only your tests, but all of the code that your test covers. So that can be difficult. So now, because Prezi doesn't really do copy-paste super well, I'm going to have to switch over to another presentation. OK, so now what? So we've gotten to the point where we've sort of found out that there's problems. We knew there were problems. What should we do with all this information? So if you're like most developers, probably not a lot, right? Like you find out there's a problem. You feel kind of bad about it. You don't like feeling bad about things, so you stop thinking about it. Um, and that is, it's very common and I do it all the time. Um, but the, sort of the point of it is to sort of keep reminding you, right? Like, hey, there's these bad things out there. So try not to be a bad developer. Um, oh, I should explain these photos. Um, oh, can you read that? Anyway, I went to Japan recently for Ruby Kaiji, which was awesome, name drop. And uh, 
they have all these wonderful English translations that don't quite work in Japan, and I just took a lot of photos of them. So, yes. Um, it is a lot to process. So let's, let's start easy. Flay is one of the easier things to understand. It's copy-paste detection, um, but also structural duplication. Um, so we're violating dry. Don't repeat yourself. And the solution is not real hard. It's just playing around with extract method. Um, you know, I, there can be other things, but these really small steps can really help later on when you need to add functionality. If everything's sort of defined into chunks that have a single responsibility, refactoring and adding new features, just, you don't even, like, you don't even realize, like, how much easier it is until you went, like, hey, that feature wasn't hard at all. Um, single responsibility principle is sort of this concept that when I was, like, a physics teacher who was just an apprentice at Object Mentor and they were telling me about this, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. I was like, okay, it should only do one thing, but there's like five lines in there. They're all doing different things. Um, and it's sort of this concept that as I've matured as a programmer, it becomes more and more interesting to me. The idea that like a method should just try and do one thing. A class should just try and will do one thing. An entire project should just try and do one thing. It can be applied at many different levels, right? That's sort of the idea of having many different services, right? If you're having a big team that has a lot of problems getting along, you can break your project up into different services that try to do just one thing. Um, the one thing definition can be tricky, but that's where the architecture hard part of software comes in. You have to sort of decide what you want things to do. So let me give you an example of this. Um, so I used to work on a project that was, uh, had a lot to do with phone numbers. And at some point we realized like we were doing all this phone number stuff in various different places. So we would get like a phone number and then we'd start doing some regex stuff to get things like area code, prefix, line number, extension, and all that stuff. And you know, obviously this is duplication. So this is like, instead of like pulling stuff out or creating private methods, it was actually just a missing object that we were missing. There really needed to be a phone number object that could do stuff with phone numbers. So that was a nice little refactoring that sort of saved us a lot of duplication. Let us move on to churn. So churn is this thing where you figure out like things that change the most. And the thing that I think bothers people about churn a lot is that sometimes it means nothing, right? Like, oh, this file has changed a lot. It's a CSS file, maybe it's supposed to change a lot. Um, I still think it's actually kind of a code smell if you have like, 10 CSS files and only one ever changes, right? Like that, I don't know if you're really dividing up your CSS the way it really should be divided up. Um, but like I said, it can indicate God objects, an object that has its fingers in all the other objects, that knows about lots of other objects and the internals of them. Because then if the internals of another object has to change, then it has to change. So if you, know, you see something that has high churn, it better be a good method and it better be well tested. Why? because everybody's in there all the time, including your worst developers. But of course, you don't have bad developers on your team. But seriously, like people inside a thing all the time, if it's complex and it's changing a lot, that's a problem, right? Because complexity can hide bugs, and if it's moving all the time, uh, you're just waiting for problems to happen. Okay. Moving on. And code coverage. All right, so a lot of times I'll hear developers uh, say something like, hey, we should just have a week to write a bunch of tests. And I just kind of cringe when I hear that. I mean, like, I like the idea of people writing tests, but I get a little worried when people are going to write tests for a week because I get concerned that people are going to be writing tests for things that they don't really understand, right? If you're writing a bunch of unit tests for something and you don't really get it, you might just be locking in a bug. So you look at the thing and you go, oh, okay, when I put in the numbers two and two, it outputs five. <coughs> cool, well, I'll just lock that in with a test. But maybe it was supposed to add those two numbers together and the output was wrong. So if you're doing code coverage, make sure that you kind of understand it. So the best way to do that is when you're inside something and you're sort of moving around the code base and you come across something that isn't covered, now is the time to cover it, because like, oh, I have to change this thing. Now would be a good time for me to really figure it out, and the best way to really figure thing out, something out is to write a bunch of tests for it, right? The, the worst way to figure something out is to write one kind of wrapper test for one method. If you don't, you know, you just kind of look at the output and then just sort of go, okay, well, let's just freeze that into a test. Um, that can create some pretty brutal tests, um, and they're actually harmful. Tests that, you know, are bad and should be removed. So. Warning, 
Flog and Zycro. Okay, so they're both different ways of measuring code complexity. Uh, flog is sort of like a superset of Cycro, because Flog includes branching. Um, cyclo, cycro is just cyclomatic complexity or pass through a method. Um, flog uses ABC metric, which is assigns, branches, and calls. So when you look at the output of Flog, you'll see you get some points for every time you make an assignment, every time you do some branching, and every time you make a call to a method. Um, and this is the super simple, completely unauthorized uh, guide to flog scores. Um, basically, my, my feeling on it is below 20, eh, you're probably okay. Uh, you're getting to a gray area here. This could be trouble, and above 60, you're, you're no, this is bad, right? And now you might say, oh, I don't know, what's, what's a 60? Uh, commonly, it's not uncommon to have like hundreds and 200s and 300s if you're running flog on a code base. Um, so, Anything above 60, though, I'm going to claim that you can probably fix this. Hey, it's Ryan Davis. Is Ryan in the audience? Hey, Ryan. Um, so I should mention that, like, metric flow really wouldn't exist without Ryan Davis, right? Like, he wrote plugin uh, Flay, but also Ruby Parser, which is behind the scenes of a lot of the things that uh, metric flow depends upon. Um, and this is a wonderful photo from Aaron. You're right over there, right? Uh, hey, hey, wait up, Aaron. Okay, um, there's a great story behind this. You should track him down to get this story. Uh, I'm gonna move on. So how do you fix things? Mostly extract method. Um, missing object, and if that doesn't work, it's now time to sort of roll up your sleeves and re-architect. And you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but you really shouldn't have to have hugely complex methods in your app. If, if you do, there's probably something you're sort of doing wrong. Um, it's, it's really time to sort of take a look at things and say like, is this architecture something that worked in the past, but now the, the metaphor of the application has changed and it no longer really applies? All right, so here's uh, more exposing flaws in the code that I work in. Uh, Multi-site helper init. It was the worst method we at. So let's take a look at this. Uh, so I work at Backstop Solutions. We write a framework for creating websites for hedge funds and for the people who use them. And the thing about hedge funds is they're, uh, they all want to look like they're their own thing. So we basically serve up a bunch of different domains and everybody like blahpartners.com wants to have two sites, sort of a private site where they can edit things and then a public site where the, their customers can see reports on how their hedge fund is doing. So, I looked into this thing and I was like, what is this? This is horrible, like just doing so much and all sort of low level stuff. And if you look, there's like all this YAML stuff. And so after digging through this a little bit, I realized like, so we have all this configuration, some of which is global, some of which has to do with the suffix they want to apply, right? Do you want to call it public.blogpartners.com and then private.blogpartners.com? No, of course not. That's too simple. They want to have something like, you know, superawesomeinvestments.blogpartners.com. And so we roll through this and we do a lot of merging. So the first thing I, uh, I did, I'm going to talk about later because I've now skipped ahead. Sorry. By the way, the method goes on. Um, this has a flop score of 169. That's brutal. Um, also, look here. Like, seriously, when the person was writing this, did they not notice this? I don't know. Anyway, um, so there's, there's a refactoring opportunity right there. Um, so like I said, the first thing I did was I pulled out this merge lifecycle YAML into site's configuration method. Because basically all I was doing is taking some YAML guys and looking at their keys and their values and sort of doing a merge. So that sort of broke out a lot of stuff right here. And what I'm trying to do this thing uh, that Glenn Vandenberg sort of uh, talked to me about uh, this Lone Star Ruby conflict a few years ago. He's talking about sort of like uniformity of methods. I'm saying it really bad. But basically the idea was that you want to have some methods that are sort of like directors and they make calls off to other methods. And then you want to have some methods that basically uh, do the low level work. And so this was my attempt, my first pass at sort of doing that. I wanted to have this guy be sort of the high level method that says, you go do this, you go do this. So you can kind of read through it and have a high level idea of what it does. And so this was the most obvious refactoring, right? Like set up private URLs and set up public URLs are basically the same thing, 
they just have this difference in visibility. One is private and one is public. So I can pull that out into one thing and then I just pass in visibility and then I can do some switching on that. And that was uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and then just a couple of other things that I noticed were like, oh, this is one section of the code. Why don't we just pull this out and make it its own method? Now the interesting thing you can have here is that oftentimes when you do the refactoring, if you add up all the flog scores, it will actually be more than the original app. And that doesn't mean you've done a bad thing because overall complexity for an entire application is not a bad thing because as an app grows, it's going to do more, it's going to be more complex. What I'm really worried about is complexity per method. Um, so I've sort of gotten this down. Now, this is by no means done. This is at the refactor stage, and we're actually just having a discussion about this earlier in the week, because to get this down to be not horrible, because if you look at this right now, you have no idea what it does still, we need to start actually doing some sort of re-architecture, um, and that, that's a little more difficult. So out of, out of the scope of this presentation. Moving on. Okay, so Reek, Rudy, and Rails best practices. Um, all these guys parse the code, look for design problems, um, which is really cool because if it says you have feature envy and you don't know what feature envy is, you can go look it up and then you say, oh wow, I'm calling this other thing more than I'm calling myself. That means maybe the method should be in the other thing instead of where it is. Um, and that's nice, but the problem is, this is a, keep in mind, this is a machine trying to tell you a human problem, right? Like all of these problems that we're talking about are problems for humans. The machine can execute it just fine. So when it says like, hey, you're in a controller and you're calling params an awful lot, this method called params, uh, maybe you just go, well, yeah, but I'm in a controller and calling params is probably something that's okay to do in a controller. Um, so you have to take these things with a grain of salt. You know, this is advice. Um, this is not the end all be all, um, like I say on this slide. Um, it's up to you and your team to establish conventions and sort of stick to them. I don't really care what the conventions are, just establish them and stick to them. You know, like sort of have rules about like what the maximum number of lines you're going to have, you're going to tolerate for a method, or how much complexity is too much complexity, and uh, what sort of code coverage you're aiming for. So resources for metric foo. Uh, so metric foo is at metric foo at rubyforge.com. It has a bunch of links to uh, all the things you could possibly need if you want to contribute or just use metric foo. Um, and that's about it. I would like to thank uh, Backstop Solutions for donating a couple of days of my time to uh, metric foo. Um, so they were very nice and gave me a couple of days last week to uh, look at and, and sort of get metric foo all sort of shaped up and ready for its 2.0 release. So the 2.0 release was released yesterday. Uh, like I said, we already have some bug reports out on it, so feel free to download it and try it. It is a point .0 release in the truest sense of the word, right? Like, I pulled in a bunch of stuff that was new, it does some really cool things, it works on all of my projects, so I'm sure it'll work on yours. Uh, questions? Yes? Uh, is it supposed to work on Rails 3.0? Because uh, in previous versions, I think one was that I would probably add better and help other things. So the question is, does it work on Rails 3? So I did, just yesterday, no, two days ago, I'm losing track of time. Two days ago, I did a I did a gem install Rails 3. I created a delete me project. I wrote a couple of tests inside there and ran metric foo on it without too much difficulty. There is some notes on the metric foo uh, main page about what you want to do if you're inside Rails 3. But I think most of those problems were the differences between active support in the past and active support in the present. Active support right now, you, you're supposed to require the, just the things you need instead of just requiring active support. Um, which is very cool. Uh, it worked for me for a pretty simple Rails app using both RSpec and test unit. So I think it's working. Obviously, uh, have a good time with that and let me know if it isn't. Yes? So one place that I fall down on Rails 3 is that Ruby parser does not parse 1.9 syntax extensions that change from 1.8. Uh, and I Yeah, yeah, keep in mind Ruby Parser uh, 
pretty complicated, right? And it's trying to do a pretty ambitious thing. So sometimes it can uh, sort of get confused, in, uh, especially when you're moving between different movies. Other questions? Yes? So the question is, what metrics would cover performance bottlenecks? None. Uh, it's not the point of metric foo. Um, I guess it could be at some point. Uh, but I mean, I guess you could make sort of grandiose claims like, oh, more complex methods or longer methods. But really, nowhere in here are we looking at something specifically in terms of performance. <coughs> so if that's what you're looking for, I don't have anything for you. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for attending, and uh, enjoy the rest of RubyCon.